I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Femara. Femara is also known as letrozole. It's an aromatase inhibitor. It's used only in postmenopausal women. It's used in those women who have hormonally responsive breast cancer following their surgery. When it was originally approved in 1997, it was used for advanced breast cancer in women who had been taking tamoxifen and had their tumor progress. But over a period of time, things have changed a little bit. So now it's used in either early breast cancer, either by itself, or following some period of time of taking tamoxifen, or it could be used in women who have advanced breast cancer, again, either as first-line therapy or after progression with the tamoxifen. Or it could be used in women who have locally advanced or even metastatic breast cancer, although in the latter instance, we have other choices like Versenio and Ibrands and Kiskali. In the United Kingdom, Femara is used in postmenopausal women with hormone responsible, responsive disease who, for one reason or another, are not good candidates either for surgery or for chemotherapy. How long should a person take the drug? Well, it's arguable. Some people say five years, some people say seven years, some people say ten years. But irrespective, we know that breast cancer is a terrible disease. It will affect somewhere around 250,000 women. A significant percentage of those on diagnosis are going to have metastatic disease, at least to the lymph nodes. Breast cancer is going to be responsible for about 40,000 to 60,000 deaths this year in the United States. The fuel for hormonally responsive breast cancer and this type of breast cancer, 70 to 80 percent of all breast cancers, the fuel is the estrogen hormone. So our job is to get rid of the estrogen hormone somehow or get rid of the effect of the estrogen. We can cut the ovaries out, we can do something to the adrenal glands, or we can change the effects of the estrogen that's already present in the body. We can use an anti-estrogen, we can use a progestational agent, we could use a blocker like Solidex or Lupron. And all of these therapies in hormone responsive disease will shrink the tumor. Well, how does Femara fit into all of this? It's an orally active, so in other words, it's a pill. It's an aromatase inhibitor. And the way it works is it prevents the body from changing male hormone into female hormone. Well, why is that important? Well, in postmenopausal women, the male hormone is going to be produced in the adrenal gland and it's going to be produced as either androstenedione or testosterone and the body's going to somehow convert it in the tissues into estrone or estradiol which are two female hormones and in order to make this conversion that occurs in the breast and the brain and other tissues the body requires the enzyme known as aromatase now we can decrease the synthesis in the peripheral tissues and in the cancer tissues within several days worth of taking this drug by about 95 percent and that causes regression of estrogen dependent tissues so that obviously is good well there's tamoxifen that's a very commonly used drug not as much now that we have the aromatase inhibitors but tamoxifen sits on the estrogen receptor and prevents the estrogen floating around from getting to the cell. The letrozole, on the other hand, again, only in postmenopausal women, it prevents the conversion of the hormone, the male hormone that's floating around in the bloodstream that now gets into the tissue. It prevents its conversion into the male hormone. And it does that in the breast and the ovary and uh, the, the brain and other tissues as well. Now, it can't be used in premenopausal women because premenopausal women are making a lot of estrogen by itself. It doesn't have to be converted from male hormone to female hormone. So it would swamp the effects of Femara. And also, it's because the estrogen is produced directly, it doesn't have to get shunted through the male hormone. Well, if we look at the aromatase inhibitors, there are several in the market. Femara that we're talking about, also known as letrozole, but then there's also Arimidex and Aromacin, and they work basically the same way. 
we know that we can reduce the incidence of breast cancer in premenopausal or postmenopausal women with tamoxifen. That's a relatively good drug and still used. It can reduce the likelihood of breast cancer by about 50% in women after they've had cancer. And even five years worth of therapy can reduce the likelihood of recurrent disease by 30% over a period of 20 years. We also could use Avista or Riloxifen, again, just postmenopausal women with that drug, or the aromatase inhibitors. And the aromatase inhibitors can reduce the likelihood of recurrent breast cancer by somewhere around 60 to 65 percent if we use treatment for three years. If we use treatment for seven years, we can decrease the likelihood of recurrence by somewhere around 50 percent. Now, at the present time, relatively few women are taking long-term therapy with tamoxifen because of studies like one called Big 198. And Big 198 was supposed to look at the relative merits of tamoxifen versus the femara versus start with one and then change to the other. But the study was stopped early, unfortunately. It was stopped early because there were some benefits that looked like they favored femara. So we don't know really the long-term outcome. We just know that short-term seems to be a difference. Well, how big is the difference? Well, if we look at the disease-free survival and people receiving the femara, it was 87%. That sounds phenomenal, but it was 85% with tamoxifen. If we look at women who didn't have any positive nodes, it was 92% with femara, and it was 90% with tamoxifen. One to three nodes, again, not much difference. It was in women who had four or more positive nodes that the advantage seems to go to femara. And additionally, there are two different kinds of breast cancers. There's breast cancer that involves the duct that goes from the surface of the skin down to the area that produces the milk. We call that ductal carcinoma. That's 90% of all cancers. And in those 90% of all cancers, there's a slight advantage in favor of the femara. On the other hand, the duct, it's, I'm sorry, the, the lobule itself can become malignant. That's what we call lobular carcinoma. And it would seem that that's where femara really shines in excess of the tamoxifen. The lobular carcinoma occurs in only about 10% of all breast cancers. So what we can say is that Big 198, that study, showed that letrozole seemed to reduce the recurrence of breast cancer slightly in favor of letrozole versus the uh, tamoxifen, but if we look at the change in survival, there wasn't any. Okay, let's do another study. So let's look at women who received five years worth of tamoxifen, and after five years, when they're disease-free, they have no evidence of recurrence, let's go and treat them with either Femara or placebo. So now we have five years survival, and now we're switching to either Femara or placebo. Who's going to do better? Well, it would appear in this case that some treatment is better than no treatment. On a relative reduction of tumor incidence, we find that there was almost a 50% reduction in the likelihood of breast cancer recurring from years 6 through 10 in those women who took Femara versus those women who took a placebo. And if we look at the likelihood of breast cancer developing in the other breast, it was again reduced by about 50%. So at two and a half years and at four years, if we look at the numbers, there's an absolute survival advantage to the Femara. 93% were alive and well versus the placebo therapy, 87% were alive and well. But let's carry out and let's look overall at what happens after about five years. doesn't seem to make any difference. And if we look at the overall survival, no difference. If we look at the distant disease-free survival, doesn't seem to make any difference. Okay, let's do another study. And here's another study that was presented just at the breast cancer meeting in December of 2017. So women received either five years worth of tamoxifen 
or the aromatase inhibitor. And then after the five years, these were women who were well, no evidence of recurrence, then they were given either two years or five years versus, ver, worth of uh, another aromatase inhibitor. This one happened to be Arimidex. So was there any advantage to two years extra therapy or five years extra therapy? No, there really wasn't. How about the side effects? Well, if there's no advantage, what about side effects? Because after all, side effects are important. And it was found that in women who received only the two years of the Arimidex, the aromatase inhibitor, the likelihood of a fracture was about 4.5%, likelihood of bone fracture, 4.5%. In women who were given five years of additional therapy, the fracture rate rose to 7%. So obviously that's not very good. Was there any specific advantage of two years versus five years as far as recurrence was concerned? The answer is absolutely no. How about overall survival? Again, absolutely no. How about the development of cancer in the other breast? No, there was absolutely no difference. So we can say that it would appear that seven years is as good as 10 years. What the study didn't show is is five years enough? So all we know now is that seven years seems to be probably the optimal therapy. Now, can this drug, can Femara or Letrozole, be used in women who have soft tissue metastases, metastases to other organs other than the breast? Well, it can be, but it doesn't seem to be extraordinarily effective. Can it be used for treatment of bone metastases? Yeah, but again, we have much better therapies theoretically in our eye brands and our other kind of therapies. So if we look at the overall survival, is Fomara really better than tamoxifen? And the answer is both have a 91 to 92 percent overall survival. Does one versus the other seem to be better to prevent cancer in the other breast? No, they're both seemingly very effective. Are there side effects of taking the Femara? Sure. Side effects with everything. Sweating, one woman in six or seven. Flushing or hot flashes, one woman in three. Bone loss, one woman in four. Also bone pain, bone fractures. Significant number of women. And if a woman has osteopenia or osteoporosis at the start of therapy, well, those women might be in line for receiving some kind of other therapy that boosts the bones, maybe some of the bisphosphonates or some other kind of therapy. The drug Femara can cause musculoskeletal pain and joint pain and edema and fatigue and headache and dizziness and drowsiness and mood swings and depression. Hair loss occurs in one woman in eight. A slight increase in the incidence of heart attacks and angina and heart failure. Drugs should not be taken in women who are pregnant, not be taken in premenopausal women, not be taken in women who are lactating, not to be taken at the same time as tamoxifen, should not take estrogen-containing medicine if you're taking Femara. The biology is relatively straightforward. You take the pill, it gets absorbed pretty good. There's about 100% bioavailability of the medicine, floats around the bloodstream, 60% bound to proteins. The half-life is about two days. It's excreted by the kidney. 90% goes out in the urine. You have to be a little careful. If you're really sensitive to lactose, because each pill has about 60 milligrams of lactose in it, and if you're lactase intolerant, that can cause some GI problems. The dose is one pill once a day, with or without food. can be taken in people who have mild to moderate liver disease. If you have severe liver disease, well, you should probably take about half as much. So take it every other day. The drug is principally used for breast cancer, but things can be used off-label. And this drug is used off-label for a variety of conditions, and it seems to work pretty well for some of them. So it's used in termination of early pregnancies, used in combination with the morning after pill. It's used in men who use androgenic steroids. 
It's used to prevent enlargement of the male breast. It's used in men who, for one reason or another, have defective sperm production. And it can be used to stimulate the ovulation in women. So it can be used in assisted reproduction. It seems to be better than a lot of the other medicines and does not seem to be associated with multiple pregnancies. If a woman is taking it for this purpose, a woman who's obviously pre-menopausal at the time, the woman takes it on day three of the cycle for five days and takes anywhere between one and three pills a day. And that seems to be quite helpful. It's also used sometimes in women who have endometriosis and it's used for polycystic ovary disease. How much does it cost? Well, if you want the brand name, if you want to take Femara, it's going to cost you cash somewhere between $730 and $780. So that's pretty doggone expensive. Even if you get the generic version, it's going to cost about $350 for a month worth of therapy. But surprisingly, if you go to a site like GoodRx.com, and there's no cost to you for doing that, then it will cost, depending on your drugstore, anywhere between $11 and $30 a month. So between $780 and $15 to $30 a month for the same thing. Well, what do we know about Femara? Femara, obviously, seems to be a pretty good drug, and it's uh, uh, one of the standards for hormonally responsive breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And this drug should probably be taken for about seven years in those women for whom it's appropriate. Now, if you want to learn more about breast cancer, you might want to listen to our videos on tamoxifen or Ibrance or even Versenio. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.